All right, officially, good morning. And a happy New Year. Um, before we start, I just want to say that I love you guys. I don't think I say that enough from the pulpit. I know sometimes I, I, I may say things or teach things that you scratch your heads about and maybe go home and wonder about me. Uh, but you always come back and you always love me anyway. And I, I appreciate that more than you can know. So thank you guys so much for being so kind to myself and to my family. Uh, we all really appreciate it and we love you guys too. So having said that, I want to jump right in to the lesson. Uh, I don't plan to speak a very long time. There's just, there's something that's on my heart and it's been on my heart for a while. And it's seeing people living in fear. Always afraid. Always afraid of what the future holds. Always afraid of what's going to happen in the future. And it's not that there aren't scary things that happen in life. There are. Life can be just downright frightening sometimes. Things that can come our way. Things that hit us blindly. Things that we don't know. People do things we never thought they would do or say things that we never imagined they'd ever say. And we get hurt and we're always afraid of what's going to happen the next day. Or a year from now. And this morning, I just want to encourage you guys to, to know that you don't have to be afraid. And I don't have to be afraid, even though I know there are some things in life that are scary. I don't have to face them in fear because I can face them in faith. And you can face them in faith. We don't know what 2023 is going to bring. We have no idea what it's going to bring. Uh, recently, I've had some, some people in my life who've had things happen to them that they never, ever dreamed would have happened to them. And yet here they are going through what they're going through. And it's scary, but you don't have to be scared. You don't have to be afraid because as Perry always says, God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. God is good. And as Christians, we need to learn how to lean into that, lean into the goodness of God and trust in the goodness of God, especially when things are happening that we they're frankly, they're out of our control. I read a post that said there there's a lot of things in life I can't control. I can't control God and I can't control others. And if I'm lucky, I can control myself. So maybe I should start there. Have faith in a good God. So I've titled this in the grip of fear. Now, I did contemplate something. I discovered something last night that really struck a chord with me. And I, I was tempted to completely change my sermon. And actually, Perry walked in on me as I was working on sermon slides, thinking I might change today's lesson. But we're going to talk about it next week. Next, we're going to talk about you are worthy. You are worthy. Um, so if you know anyone that needs to hear that message, invite them to come next week to hear about their worth. Sometimes I think in church we talk too much about how unworthy we are. And maybe we need to flip the script on that and talk about how worthy we are. But that'll be next week. This week we're talking about fear. And rather than doing, doing some stories that are overlooked, we're going to do some stories I'm going to call Look Again. Because these are both stories that we've read a couple of times. Some of them maybe just once. Uh, the first one we've read a few times. But sometimes it's always good to re be reminded of some of these stories. The first story comes to us from the book of Leviticus. Your favorite book and my favorite book of all of Holy Writ. The book of Leviticus. We're going to look at chapter 10, which is the only chapter in Leviticus that really tells a story. The rest are all laws, which is why you're always tempted to skip it. When you're trying to read through your Bible this year, you look to Leviticus and you say, oh, it's okay. Skip to chapter 10 and then move on to the next book. If that's what you need to do, don't let it block you. Read the good part that, you, that speaks to you and, and keep on moving. Leviticus chapter 10. I'm going to look at Moses as Moses is gripped by fear. 
Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, took their censers, put fire in them, and added incense, and they offered unauthorized, or your version might say strange fire, before the Lord, contrary to his command. So up until this point, we've been given law after law of what they were supposed to do, and now the day has come, and many speculate that this is the day of atonement sacrifice, because it talks about atonement in this chapter. And so they're getting ready to perform the very first official sacrifice, having an actual sanctuary in which to do a sacrifice with an official altar to do it on. And this is the very first one. Everything's been set up. Everything's going to go great. We know it because it's the very first time. But within two verses, actually just one verse. They've already done something wrong, right? They've already authored up an unauthorized or a strange fire. No one knows precisely what that means, but there's something off about what these two priests, these two sons of Aaron are doing. It says, so fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them and they died before the Lord. Now, if that doesn't scare you, if you were there, especially if you're the next priest in line to pick up where they left off, be a very scary time. These two guys just got burnt to a crisp. And now it's your turn. I might want to find out what that strange fire was at that point. So they die. It says, Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not let your hair become unkempt. Or in other words, don't cover your head or don't mess up your hair. Don't, don't be pulling out your hair because of the grief that you're feeling. And do not tear your clothes, or you will die. And the Lord will be angry with the whole community. So he has some instructions. He says, okay, look, this thing just happened. Now, if you got to keep on keeping on. you got to keep doing the work that we're supposed to do, but don't be sad. Don't mess up your hair. Don't tear your clothes. Don't do any of the things that would indicate to anyone that you are grieving, because if you do, you'll die too. No pressure. Keep on going. God will be angry with you and he'll kill you and he'll be angry with all of us. It's a lot of weight to carry on your shoulders. But your relatives, all the Israelites, those who aren't priests serving, they may mourn for those the Lord has destroyed by fire. Do not leave the entrance to the tent of meeting or you will die because the Lord's anointing oil is on you. So they did as Moses said. Moses said to Aaron and his remaining sons, Eleazar and Ithamar, take the grain offering left over from the food offerings prepared without yeast and present it to the Lord and eat it beside the altar for it is most holy. So in other words, and we've looked at this story before, you have to keep eating. You have to go through the process because if you do not go through the process, Moses says, I already know God's angry with us. He's already killed two people. And if you're not careful, he'll kill you. And he'll be angry with the rest of us. And who knows what will happen to us. So don't mess it up. Don't do anything wrong. My understanding is Moses is scared. He is afraid. I don't blame him. He is afraid. He says, eat it in the sanctuary area. Because it is your share and your son's share of the food offerings presented to the Lord. For so I have been Commanded. In other words, these first two guys, they disobeyed a command and they're dead. We still have a lot of commands left to fulfill. Don't mess up or we'll be dead too. He's afraid. He says, but when Moses inquired about the good of the sin offering and found that it had been burned up, he was angry with Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's remaining sons, and asked, Why didn't you eat the sin offering in the sanctuary area? It is most holy. It was given to you to take away the guilt of the community by making atonement for them before the Lord. So in other words, this is the atoning sacrifice for you and for all of us, and you were supposed to eat it, but instead you let it get burnt up or turned into smoke is what it actually says. And Moses is upset and he is angry because he is afraid that they have just doomed everyone. Aaron replied to Moses, Today they sacrifice their sin offering and their burnt offering before the Lord. But such things as this have happened to me. Would the Lord have been pleased if I had eaten the sin offering today? When Moses heard this, he was satisfied. 
Now, if you grew up in the churches of Christ, you are very familiar with the first part of the story, mainly the first two verses. The unauthorized fire, right? But what you didn't know is the rest of the day did not go as planned either. Aaron and his sons deliberately did not eat what they were commanded to eat. And yet, nothing happened to them. They were fine. And Aaron offers up this question to Moses. And it's a question that I think for this year we need to center on is, do you think God would have been happy if I had done this, this, and this? Do you think he would have been pleased? Now, if you were in a biblical argument with Aaron, you would have said, Aaron, book, chapter, verse, please show me where you're getting your information that you didn't need to eat it. And Aaron would have produced nothing. He would have produced, I think I know the heart of God. And I don't think God would be happy with me when at the passing of my sons, I sat down and ate a meal as if nothing had happened. And Moses likes his answer. And no one else dies that day. Now, if you want to ask me more about this story, because I don't want to get into the weeds of it, but if you're like, if you're a weeds person, and you say, well, what about this? And what about that? And how about this? Come talk to me after church. Send me a text message. We can get together and talk. But this morning, I just want to focus in on the fear that Moses had. He was afraid of God. But Aaron was not. Aaron seemed to know something about God that Moses had not yet learned or he had forgotten in the moment. But Aaron reminds him, I don't think I have to be afraid, Moses. I think I'm actually doing what God would want me to do by not following the command. Isn't that weird? That is so strange. How about this story of the cursed honey? Do you remember this story? It's been about a year, so if you don't remember it, that's fine. But we have looked at it before. This is look again, not overlooked. This is look again. This is the story of Jonathan and Saul when they're out in battle. And Saul makes this crazy, absurd oath that while they're in the midst of battle, they're going to not eat anything until they vanquished his enemies. That's a bad idea. Let's read about it. 1 Samuel chapter 14, it says, That day, after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Ahijlan, they were exhausted, of course, because they hadn't eaten anything. They pounced on the plunder, and taking sheep and cattle and calves, they butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. So it had been so long since they'd eaten, when they finally won the battle, because remember, they were all following this oath, as we'll find out, except for Jonathan. Jonathan didn't follow it because he was out fighting another battle and didn't hear his dad make this crazy oath. They finally win, and they're so hungry. I don't know what the hungriest you've ever been, but I have never been this hungry. I've never butchered an animal and just started eating. That's what they're doing. It's savage. They're starving. They finally win the battle. They take the animals and they slaughter them and they don't even cook them. They just start eating right then and there. Of course, if you know your Old Testament law, you know that this is a big no-no. If you're a civilized person, you also know this is a big no-no. You got to heat it up first. This is a big no-no. You don't eat anything with the life in it, with the blood in it. This is a major mistake on their part. But it's also a major mistake on Saul's part because... He told them not to eat anything, and who knows how long that went on. They're starving. Jonathan, again, didn't know about it, so when he was walking through a field and there was honey, he dipped his staff in the honey and ate some of the honey, and they told him, oh, Jonathan, you shouldn't have done that. We forgot to tell you, your dad made this oath. And I imagine Jonathan rolling his eyes going, my dad. Him and his crazy oaths. Wouldn't it have been better if we'd eaten along the way? It sure would have. So here they are, they're all eating this an- these animals that have been cut up, they're not cooked, they're chowing down because they're starving to death. And of course Saul gets scared, 
because they are directly disobeying a command. It says, then someone said to Saul, look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, go out among the men and tell them, each of you bring me your cattle and sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So he's trying to rectify the situation. He's actually building an altar. And they're going to make some sacrifice and they're going to cook some food and then they're going to eat it so that they're not disobeying the command of God. So everyone brought out his ox that night and slaughtered it there. Then Saul built an altar to the Lord. It was the first time he had done this. Which is an interesting to note because actually the chapter before this, he had done this. But anyway, it's not chronological, people. So this is the first time he had done this. Saul said, let us go down and pursue the Philistines by night and plunder them till dawn and let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. But the priest said, let us inquire of God here. So now that they've, he's like, okay, I've rectified the situation. Our soldiers, they're now been forgiven. We've done the sacrifice at the altar that I made. Everything is good. Now God can bless us still. Of course, God had not cursed them yet, but he's convinced that he would have. That's why I did the sacrifice. Because he's scared. He says, okay, now that we have that dealt with, Let's go off into battle. Let's battle the Philistines. And all the soldiers say, eh, whatever you want to do. They seem to be along for the ride for whatever Saul says. Almost. And a priest says, uh, shouldn't we ask God first? Maybe see what God has to say. Saul says, ah, that's a good idea. So Saul asks God, shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. So Saul's like, okay, well, whose fault is it? Right? Because Saul's life wasn't quite like yours and I's. He kind of hoped to hear from God every single time he did anything. He wanted to have a word from God first. So when God doesn't answer him, he doesn't do what we do, which is just another typical day. Didn't get the direct information I'd hoped for. No revelations, no signs and wonders in the sky. I just prayed a prayer and I'm hoping for the best. For Saul, that's not good enough. He's like, no, no, no. I need to know what's going to happen. I will not battle the Philistines if I don't know for sure I'll win. And to know for sure I'll win, I have to hear from God. But God doesn't answer him. Saul therefore said, come here, all of you are leaders of the army, and let us find out what sin has been committed today. So he's convinced someone has done something wrong, and that is why God is not answering me. I'm sure glad none of us think this way today, huh? As surely as the Lord who res rescues Israel lives, even if the guilt lies with my son Jonathan, he must die. Again, the way the stories are told in the Bible, these are all notes, these are all clues as to where the story is going. We already know it was Jonathan, supposedly, because he ate honey when he wasn't supposed to, the cursed honey. But not one of them said a word, so they're not going to Turn Jonathan over. They don't say anything. Saul then said to all of the Israelites, You stand over there. I and Jonathan, my son, will stand over here. So all you blood eaters, you go over there. My son Jonathan and I will stand over here. And according to the story, Saul's convinced it's them. They've done something wrong. So again, they say, Do what seems best to you. Then Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel, Why have you not answered your servant today? If the fault is in me or my son Jonathan, respond with Urim. Now, again, if you don't know what that is, come see me. But if the men of Israel are at fault, respond with Thummim. Jonathan and Saul were taken by Lot, and the men were cleared. So now it's just down to the two of them. Was it Saul or Jonathan's fault that God's not answering? Saul said, cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. And then he confesses this awful, horrible, wretched thing that he had done. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now I must die. I can just hear the sarcasm all over that verse. Like, really, Dad? Really? You're going to condemn me to death because I ate a little bit of honey in a battle? Now I'm going to die. Here we go. Saul said, may God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. Now, I like this verse, because if you know the story, Jonathan doesn't die. And God doesn't deal with him ever so severely either. 
But the men said to Saul, Should Jonathan die? He who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never! As surely as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground, for he did this today with God's help. So they won this battle. So if Jonathan hadn't been with us, we wouldn't have won. And that means God is with him. And if God's with him, then how can you be against him? So the men rescued Jonathan, and he was not put to death. And neither was Saul. Nothing happened. Nothing happened because they ate the blood with the meat. Nothing happened because Jonathan had broken the oath of his father. Nothing happened at all. All this fear and all this worry and all this anguish. Nothing happened. Sounds a lot like the worries we have. So my encouragement to you in the year of 2023 is know the heart of God. Know the heart of God. I know Moses is, is worth imitating at times, but so is Aaron. Know the heart of God. Know who God is. Know his goodness and his grace and his love for you. You don't have to be afraid all the time. And I see so many people, they walk around in fear. Some are paralyzed sometimes by it. Well, if I do this, then this is going to happen. And if I do that, and then that happens, then this is going to happen. And so I'm just not, not going to do anything at all. I'll just sit here until I die. It's no way to live. You have to live in faith. You have to live in faith knowing that God is with you and God is for you and God loves you. I think I've told this story before, but one of my former bosses, he was, he was always traveling quite a bit and he would come back and he would hope that maybe we had made some, some, some decisions without him. But more times than not, we would say, well, Bill, we were going to do this or that, but we thought maybe you're going to be back in three days, so we would just ask you when you got back. And he would always say, I'd rather you make a wrong decision, but you make it, than make no decision at all, because that's just as wrong. What are you so afraid of? Well, I'm afraid you'd be angry at me. But making no decision doesn't make you think I might be angry? Now, I'm not saying I understand this, but I think if we could just better understand the heart of God, we wouldn't be walking around fearful all the time. Life's going to throw some stuff at us. It's going to be hard. It's going to be stuff we never, ever expected to have to deal with. That's life. But we don't have to be paralyzed because we're afraid. When I first tried out here, before, for those of you who don't know, before I worked as a minister in a church, I spent 14 years in office furniture sales. You can, you can see the easy transition, right, from sales to this. It's, it needs no explanation. And that was one of the things people would say is, well, aren't you afraid of the change? I'm like, I can't be afraid of the change. Aren't you going to make less money? Yeah, I'm going to make less money. That's not the only thing I should be worried about or be thinking about or have on my radar is how much money I have coming in. Because all that would mean is I'm just afraid of not having money. So I spend my entire life basing every decision I ever made on how much I'm going to get paid. Sounds ridiculous when I say it like that, doesn't it? And yet we do. If I do this and then have that, if I can't do this, I better do it. But 
I'm not saying don't think and don't plan, but I am saying just have faith in God. End of the day, we make our plans, we have our thought processes, we strategize pros and cons. End of the day, we're trusting God. Remember the parable that Jesus told of the people with the talents? And some people went out and they used their talents and they got more talents and God is pleased. And, but one guy, he, just, he was so f- afraid. He took it and he buried it in the ground and it did nothing. And that's where many of us are sometimes tempted to go is just bury that in the ground. Just bury it. But we do that because we don't know the heart of God. So I'd like to end with the words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Last week I looked at the Sermon on the Plain. This morning, or this evening, we'll look at the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. I mean, that's just, you could just stop right there. That's literally the only thing I ever worry about, right? I worry about my life and included my life as my family and my friend. I, I, that's, if I'm going to worry, it's going to be about that. Jesus, not even about that. Don't worry about your life, what you will eat or drink or about, what you're, about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? I mean, don't you just love Jesus? And I'm sure he says it so nicely. (laughs) But what a challenge. Don't be like Moses running around scared. Or Saul running around scared. Or a whole bunch of other biblical characters we could look at that were always afraid. Don't even worry about your life. Don't even worry about what you eat or what you wear. Life is more than that. And if life is more than that, then don't be consumed by that. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Remember, he's talking to a beleaguered group of people up on a mountain. And when he tells them not to worry about what you're going to eat, they don't have a refrigerator filled with food to go back home to. This is rubber meets the road. This is feet on the ground. They don't have a closet filled with options. You of little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. And this is where trusting in the goodness of God happens. Because it's one thing to know that he knows that you need it, but will he provide it? Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? It might be tempting, but don't do it. If you then, though you are evil... Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Walk into 2023 bold. Walk into it fearless. Because even if you mess up, and you will, God is still with you. You can't shake them. If you were to ascend to the heavens, there he is, down to the pits of death. There he is. You can't escape God. Which means you can't escape his goodness. Goodness. 
And the contrast Jesus creates in that is like, you know that you don't always do everything right, right? You're evil. You do things that are wrong. But even you know how to give good gifts. Even though you do have a couple selfish bones in your body. And even though you might think over it two or three or four times, eventually you will give the good gift. But we're talking about God here. Trust in God. Be fearless in God. Go out knowing that God is with you and he loves you and he is for you. Be fearless. Amen? Amen. Amen.